Rebecca, welcome to Deep Into Sleep. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm very happy to have you because I know you have helped a lot of women、uh, to get unstuck from their life, which is great. So before we get started, how about you introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah, so I am the author of the Clarity Journal, and I've also been a coach for a very long time. So I really work on helping people figure out what they're going to do next with their lives. And I think, as we all know, when you're trying to figure that out, you end up going back and forth and going around in circles. And so it's my job to help people get out of that going around in circle and start moving forward. Wow, that's awesome. When you mentioned that, I just look back to my life. I remember when I first got graduated, got my license. I was trying to figure out the next step of my life.、Um, around that time, I think I even had difficulties paying rent from month to month. Right? I I live in San Francisco Bay Area, very expensive as a、uh, immigrant. I don't have families here and newly graduate. So that definitely keep me like. Uh, up in the night, day after day, think about what I should I do, where I can find a good job, or should I do my own thing? Is that too risky? Well, that's a huge like decision to make in life. So I'm I'm curious how you help people with such a big life decision, right? <laughs> um. So I think part of it is getting them to step back a little bit and stop going around and around in circles.、Mm-hmm. So a lot of times I find that when you Ask questions and really start diving into the how and the what. A lot of times, when I'm working with someone, it really becomes apparent they're not trying to figure out what they want, like, and they have no idea. What they're really trying to do is figure out which of a couple decisions they really should be making. And so, as once you start breaking it down into smaller decisions that you need to make, things become easier. And also, just the very fact that you're talking to someone. Who's not your family? Who's not your mom? Who's not your best friend? Who isn't like pigeonholing you in what they already know from, about you? I find that it really helps you start m- feeling more confident in yourself. And I don't know about you, like most of my clients and myself, like your parents always want the best for you. And I mean, especially if you're an immigrant, I imagine you know they're coming at it from just such a different. Place that they're trying to help you, but by trying to help you, they make you scared.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so it's really then, like as you said, like you can't sleep. I mean, I've definitely been there too about really worrying about money and am I doing the right thing because I'm not making very much, like rents month to month. If I remember one time when I was when my rent was month to month, and I you know it was. Just, Right when I finished school, like I broke my arm, and you know we're both in the U.S. I didn't have health insurance, and I almost didn't go to the doctor because it's、oh. so expensive. You know, like there's just all of these worries, and they compound. And so I think that a lot of it is stepping back and really being able to look at it with fresh eyes, because when you're in the middle of it, sometimes you're just going around in circles. And the going around in circles isn't very productive because usually when you're going around in circles, that's more about fear and uncertainty than it is really about going after your dreams. Wow, I really like that. What you mentioned、um, actually remind me of a very ancient Chinese wisdom. We say you step back. A little bit, you will find the sky is broader, the ocean is wider,、um, just by stepping back. So you have a wider view of what's in front of you, right? I feel like that's exactly what you've been doing. You put that philosophy into something practical and really help your clients to be able to see it. I love that. I'm gonna have to go look that up, and because、uh, I'm gonna write that down after this. But yeah, and, and so I think that when I came up with the Clarity Journal, I came up with it because I was at my own crossroad, and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. I had just had my second child, and my life was very chaotic.、Uh, that second child is a delight and wonderful, but at the time he had a lot of ear infections and just medical needs, and so it just. Compiled everything, and I just felt like I was going to go crazy with how much I was trying to get done. And so I was talking to a friend about what do I want to do and how do I want to do it, where do I want to go from here. 
And she was so funny. She stopped me. Finally, I was probably talking for an hour. (laughs) She's like, Becca, stop. You're a coach. What would you tell yourself? And I was like, okay, yes, I can do this. I know how to do this. And I went and I just wrote down everything I could think of, all the questions I asked my clients to help them gain clarity. And as I was writing down those questions and answering them for them for myself, I realized just how much power there is in the question itself. And so I wrote them down and eventually created a book out of it. Wow. Yes, that's wonderful. I, I'm going to have to read your book. And uh, I think that's because I know so many clients, so many people are stuck in their life. And I really, what really uh, connects was the fear you just mentioned. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people, including a lot of my friends, uh, including myself. So I think the fear piece is sometimes we worry about real things like mm-hmm. money, food, can I survive, right? Right. Sometimes for some people at certain stage of life, we are fear of like what we, we don't even know what we are fear of. Right. Yeah, some people just get stuck and unhappy, but somehow right. it's too scary to step out of this comfort zone to try something different, try something new. Well, and I think a lot of times we get stuck on, we're afraid we're going to make the wrong decision. And because we're so focused on being afraid of making the wrong decision, we don't recognize that all of the decisions we're trying to make, all of them could be right. And they're all like say about 80% right, 80 to 90% right. So there's no answer that is the next step that is going to be a hundred percent right. And then everything else gets a failing grade. You're really just looking at, you're looking at real human life. And so real human life, you're not going to have the perfect answer. You're going to have the next best answer. And so I think that when you start talking to someone else, when you start stepping outside yourself, you can gain a little more calm and feeling settled in the fact that it's not the perfect answer, but it is the right answer. And I think sometimes people need permission for that and they have a hard time getting that permission from their family and friends. And then they kind of get stuck because they're trying to convince themselves they should do something that they know in their heart they don't want to do. And then I think also a lot of times people will want the right answer forever. Like, I am going to do this and this is going to be perfect. And it's a lot of pressure because we are always constantly growing and changing. And so nothing that you decide here and now is going to be what you're doing in 20 years. Anything that you're deciding here and now at best, you're going to be doing it for three to five years, and then you're going to change and grow and decide to do something a little bit different. So you just need to be making sure you're on the right path. Right. Yeah. A lot of, I feel like a lot of uh, regulations, rules, and expectations, judgment, what is right, what is wrong. I want to do the right thing. I want to do the perfect thing all the time. And I think uh, it's interesting you mentioned family and friends. Family, friends have really good intentions for us, right? But the intention come from, from wanting us to have some secure foundation of life. But security sometimes is conflict with risk-taking and trying something. Also deep down what we really like, only we know our passion, right? Are we suffering? Are we happy? Only we know. A lot of times people from outside feels like you have a perfect life. Your life is great. Your job is great. What are you complaining about? But for a lot of people inside, they feel miserable. Exactly. And I think that that's like the real thing that you need to be paying attention to because if you're struggling because people in your lives have your life have certain expectations and you're trying to fit yourself in their box, that's just not going to work. And eventually you're going to rebel against it. And, and it's exhausting. It's exhausting to take on other people's expectations and try to feel like you have to fit them in because life is hard enough for each of us individually with all of our own expectations and all of our own responsibilities. But if you take it on too much, what other people want to, you just, you lose yourself. Right. Right. 
Yeah, so that come back to this concept of self care. I think、mm-hmm. I know a lot of people they really prioritize everyone, everything ahead of themselves, right? I need to do this thing perfectly, or I need to take care of this person's feeling, that person's feeling, and then they are exhausted at the end of the day without even realizing they are just draining themselves out, right? And then. And then they go and do something that is self care. That they say they go to do yoga. They go take a bubble bath. But then they get out and they look at their phone. And while they were, you know, doing self care, their whole phone blew up with all the messages from their family or from their boss, and they're right back from where they started. And so I think that for me, like when people talk about self care, so often. I hear people say you need self care to like stay stable and to stay like yourself. But if you're already taking on too much, that self care is not going to actually help you gain the peace that you want. Because what you really need is to tell people no, to tell people you can't do it. That you know what you really need to do is find a new job. If the boss just keeps blowing up your phone while you're in yoga, like that's stressful. And I think so often we tell people that they shouldn't react to stress. Like I think that we almost gaslight, especially women. Like, oh, you shouldn't react emotionally to this. You shouldn't react emotionally to that.、And、it's like, well. I am feeling emotions. I am feeling stressed out because you are asking me to do more than I can do. I am feeling stressed out because I am trying to manage this and three other things, and I literally don't have the time in the day. That stress is valid. Like if you're feeling that stress right now, or if you're feeling the stress of trying to make a career decision, or if you're feeling the stress of being unemployed, all of those things are extremely valid and. Well, yes, like trying to process through them is a good thing. Ignoring them tends to keep you stuck where you are. Wow. Yeah. Avoidance only gives us temporary <laughs> peacefulness, right? But then it's even more. That's interesting. I really like how you think about self care because a lot of people think, oh, self care. I need to be nice to myself. Do something nice for myself. Um, I know that I do that. It's not helpful, but、It's、I think not. right. You really point out the core here is we still need boundary in life. We need boundary with families, with boss, with work. The boundary may look from different from person to person, but that should be combined together with self care and boundary self. Boundary setting self possibly is a way of self care. Right. Well, it was so funny. I was reading an article recently, and the person talked about taking five deep breaths as being self care. And I was just like, <laughs> okay, if you don't have good enough boundaries in your life to be able to have more time for self care than five deep breaths, like, <laughs> of course you're stressed out. <laughs> like, it's、right. not gonna. I mean, it'll help, like in the very short term, but. You just hit the like the nail on the head. You need better boundaries. Like the real problem is that you need better boundaries, and the reason why we keep telling women, especially because if you look at like where people keep talking about self care, it's not in the New York Times, it's not in the Wall Street Journal, it's in like Cosmo or like Vogue. I mean, it's always in things that are directed for women, and what we really need to be telling women is. You need boundaries so you have time to yourself to take care of yourself. Oh, I like that. Right, boundaries come first. You need the boundaries, and then you will have room. You will have space and time to really do something. Yeah,、wow. yeah. But then, I'm I'm curious. Uh, when you work with a lot of women, especially, when can they get the signal? The warning sign that oh this this relationship or this job is too toxic or it's really pushing my boundary too much. I need to start making some change. I think that most women、um, already know that it needs to change, especially with a boss. I think it's harder with your kids or with your husband because that's kind of messier and more human. 
Um, but I think that with your boss, I don't think I've ever talked to anyone that has bad boundaries with their boss where they were like, maybe I don't. It's always like, it's always, but they don't say that they have bad boundaries. What they say is the boss is asking too much of me. The boss keeps piling on stuff. The boss doesn't understand how much work I have. Or a lot of times it's not the boss, it's the boss's boss. Like the boss's boss is not letting us hire more people. The boss's boss, like the budget is keeping us, keeping me working the work of three employees. And I think when I start hearing that, I also listen because I often hear, I can't leave right now. I need to finish this project. If I leave right now, if I start job searching right now, then I am going to be hurting my coworkers. And that is a really good example of boundaries because that job will fire you and give you not even two weeks notice if they want to. And you are literally giving them your soul. You're giving them your life because if you are allowing them to stress you out so much that you are like in a toxic re- environment where you are actually like under a lot of stress, you're like flooding your body with cortisol and you're flooding your body with adrenaline and you're feeling anger. And it's, it is toxic. And even if you love your boss and it really is the management of the company, you don't owe the company anything. And quite frankly, like your boss should find a new job too. Like that's basically all I can say is like, you can't play a game of chicken with everyone around you. Who's going to get the first job offer. Like you just need to take care of yourself again, putting your own gas mask on, recognizing you aren't in a good environment. Everyone else can take care of themselves. But if you are in a good environment, if you don't have a place where you can enforce boundaries and have a reasonable expectation of work-life balance, then it's on you to change that. And I think also a lot of people fall into the trap of hoping they're going to change. And I'm just going to say, like, if you ever asked a girlfriend Like if you were dating some guy and you asked a girlfriend, like, should I marry this guy? I I'm hoping he will change. It's relationship advice. 101. No, he's not going to change. This is who he is. Well, the company's not going to change. Your boss is not going to change. The situation is almost certainly not going to change on your time frame. They may give you a promotion in three years, but you're already burnt out now. Like, stop focusing on that and start focusing on like helping yourself because also like I've had a lot of people get job, like if they get a job offer and they tell their boss, all of a sudden they have an extra 20,000 in their budget to give you a raise. So they don't lose you (laughs) all of a sudden having the title bump up. Isn't such a big deal. Like they, if they actually value you and you go get another job offer you will be shocked at how quickly things change. And if they don't value you, which is oftentimes the case, they just don't value you. Like they don't value any of their employees. It's a company that's toxic. They don't value their employees. Then they're not going to value you. They're going to say, go ahead and go. And then, you know, and it's really sad when people get stuck in this feeling of like, I need to make this work. I need to do this. I need to get them to change. I need to convince them to change because I mean, there are steps I can take to help people make better boundaries. And sometimes that will change the situation, certainly. But I can't change someone else's corporate culture. Right, right. Wow, that's so true. I like the analogy between relationship 101 (laughs) versus uh, career 101, right? But it's the same thing. Toxic relationships are toxic relationships. (laughs) Right. I think it's in any relationships, um, work or romantic relationship, similarly in a way that, yes, we can be the one, be, we can be more assertive. We can really speak out. We can say no. We can s- learn how to set boundaries that sometimes help the environment, help ourselves mostly uh, right. to turn things around a little bit. But eventually, I think it's really 
important what you mentioned that we need to ask ourselves. Like, right. are we happy? Are we feel like we are appreciated and valued? It's not something you can keep on asking your boss. Hey, can you appreciate me more? Right? It, it, it's hard. Um, you can claim your credit, but the whole environment, how how the environment is run uh, in your workplace, gonna be so so tough, especially for large companies. I know I, I see a lot of um, people working for large companies, and they all have their own struggles. Right. Well, and I think also there's two problems. Sometimes it's just that the person that I'm talking to was a people has been a people pleaser. And so if you are always saying yes, your boss is naturally going to take advantage of that. Your boyfriend's going to naturally take advantage of that. Anyone is going to take advantage of that because if you're always saying yes, then it's easy to think, oh, she has the time for it. She always says yes. And when I say that to people, they stop and they're like, they get really quiet for a second. Cause it's like, oh, right. I, I feel like I always have to say yes. And you don't have to say no like in a rude way. You could you can put it back on them. If I do that, you have already given me these three priorities. If I take on this fourth priority, I am not going to be able to do all of them to my fullest. You're going to need to direct me to which one I need to let go of. And that always makes people stop and think like, especially bosses. It's like, oh, okay. Well, what is the priority? Sometimes the answer is yes. I actually do need you to take on this new thing. That other thing isn't as important, but put them on the spot, make them the, make the judgment call of what is and isn't important with your time and not in a complaining way, but in a way that you're like really being strong and powerful and recognizing your value And that the fact that you can't do everything is actually an indication of your value. Like you do things well. And so if I'm going to do something well, I need to have the time and the space to actually do it. Right, right. Wow. And sounds like the time and space can be created by ourselves, by what we do. Yep. And I'm going to just say anyone who's listening to this, if they find themselves in that, in this situation that we're talking about right now, when you get a new job, really be careful about sending boundaries at the beginning. Do not go into the job saying yes to everything, because if you do, it's very hard to bring that back. It's very hard to change that once that is the pattern. And so you're going to need to really focus on becoming more comfortable with boundaries so that you don't get into the situation in the first place where people are taking advantage of you. Oh, I like that. That's so important. I think we sometimes just get lost in the process of doing things and forget actually our behaviors somewhat train other people, how they can treat us. Right. Right. Yeah. And that become a pattern. Yep. It does. Well, and it does, it just cycles through everything because if you are stressed out, you are not sleeping well, you are not you're snapping at your family when they ask you something because you're stressed out and that you are responding in ways that are creating even more stress in your life because you haven't, you don't have the space for yourself to begin with. Right. When you talk about snapping to the family, definitely. Um, I know like some women, when they're really stressed out or cannot sleep well, tend to be more irritable towards right. people around them during the daytime. And that can scare the kids and can cause tension in the like family, marriage. So, um, but that also can be a big barrier for a lot of women to make decisions, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, I have family, I have children, I am responsible to, you know, keep this job or stuck in this situation. I'm just unable to move at all. So, is there anything you like can recommend to women who are struggling with this kind of stuckness when they have children, when they have family, when they have a lot of responsibilities, they think they cannot just, uh, you know, change their life easily. That is the hardest one. 
And I've been there like changing things, especially with young kids is just, you're already underwater. So I would say though, that there is probably space to be asking and demanding for help from your spouse. Um, you know, saying I am going to on Saturday afternoon, go to Starbucks for four hours and work on my resume. I can't actually do it here while listening to the two-year-old and the four-year-old fight. Just can't do it. You know, it gets easier and easier as the kids get older. Like I have a seven-year-old and a 12-year-old and I could probably jam out a resume if I put them in on, especially the seven-year-old on a screen, (laughs) but it's, it really depends. Like when you're in the thick of it with little kids, it feels like it's never ending. Like you have not had enough sleep. You don't have enough space. You're just like reacting to everything. And I think a lot of times, um, when you're in the middle of that, it almost becomes easier to do everything than to try to outsource it because your brain is so fried. You can't articulate what you need. And so I would suggest if you are in this space with little kids, um, really focus on the fact that this is actually useful. You will be a better mom if you are feeling stronger, if you're not depleted at work. And I think that if anyone's listening to this before they have kids, I just implore you so many moms will like, I I hear it a lot. Oh, I want to stay in this job because I'm going to get maternity benefits. (laughs) I'm sitting here like, oh my God, but you hate this job. And how easy do you think it is to get a job after the baby is born? Like it is not easy at all. Like you are going to be fried and you are not going to get any sleep and you're not going to be sending out resumes while also working off of four hours of sleep because the baby's up in the middle of the night and you're still working full time. Like that's not happening. And everyone's like, Oh, well, I will start applying while I'm on maternity leave. I'm like, you need to be resting when you're on maternity leave. You need to let your body heal. We, I mean, assuming you're not in Scandinavia, if you get a like one year maternity leave, sure. You can start job searching at the end. But if you're in the U S and you have somewhere between a two week and a three month maternity leave, that is not reasonable. So I think that it's really about like recognizing that we are not superhuman. Like we actually have needs and those needs are valid and setting our, like recognizing that early enough to set ourselves up for success. Wow. I love that. That's so important, right? Everyone who are listening, remember to look inside to find what you really need and find a way to satisfy your need. It's, it's valuable. You are you're worthy, right? Your, your needs deserve to be met. Right. Yeah. 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 And if you're struggling with this, I will also really recommend there's a book called burnout. And I feel like it has really helped me even recognize my own needs, like, and recognize my responses to trying to ask people for help and why that was scary. So (laughs) I am not necessarily an expert on this. I read books by the experts on this. Great. Yeah. Burnout is a huge topic and right. if you are interested, you can look at the book and your own book, the Clarity right. Journal, right? So um, who, if our audience are curious about your book, um, can you explain more about your book? Who are good candidates to, to read this book? Okay. So the book is a series of writing prompts um, with a lot of quotes and lot of food for thought for how to be thinking about clarity. And I think pretty much anyone who is stuck in the decision and the trying to figure out what they're doing, that cycle where you're just spinning your wheels and not really sure. I think that physically sitting down with the book and just answering a couple questions, you will start to feel more and more clear. I find that people will take a look at it and be like, wow, this is a lot of questions. It's not to be done, like you don't have to sit down and do the whole book, but just getting started with looking a little bit outside of yourself. My favorite question in the whole journal, and we all have our favorites. 
I am my favorite. It is who do you envy and what does that tell you about yourself? And I love that because it just gets you out of your own mind. We usually are trying to push away those negative emotions and envy is definitely one that doesn't feel very safe, but we envy specific people. We don't usually envy everyone in a career path we want to go in. We envy the person that seems like they have like very specific things that we want. We don't like, if you were wanted to be a singer, you wouldn't envy every singer you'd envy someone very specific. They have the lifestyle that you want. They sing the songs you want, whatever, whatever that is. Um, if you wanted to be in politics, you'd have again, like just one or two people that you really envy. And so I think that going through and being able to analyze our negative responses, as well as our positive ones really helps us move forward. I think also the book spends a lot of time talking about getting your friends and mentors really behind you. And I think that a lot of people will talk about wanting mentors and they act like it's something that is by luck, by chance, but it's not like getting a mentor is really more about actually reaching out and asking for help. So it's about really kind of creating the structures in your life where you can move forward with more momentum. Wow. That's great. I hear a lot of spontaneous actions, right? right. Yeah. Like trigger, use something to not really trigger, inspire possibly is the best way to say it. Right. Yeah. By asking yourself certain questions, if you don't know how, read back a book, right? Uh, and get inspired by those questions and help us think deeper. Mm-hmm. Think about things we've been trying to avoid, or we don't have time to ever think about, or we just ignored. Uh, And really give yourself time to look at those questions and think about it. That, I I like that because I think it's empower everyone, empower ourselves. Eventually the answer comes from ourselves. Not other people tell us what you should do, or this is the best way, do this, not do that, right? Nobody can tell us that, even though we hope so. That's exactly it. Like no one else is actually going to be able to give you your answer besides you. And if you try to let other people give you the answer, you're going to feel stuck still because it doesn't come from within. Yeah, that's awesome. So Becca, if any of our audience are curious about your coaching service, where can they find you? How can they contact you to book your service? Yeah. So my website is BeccaRibbing.com. So B E C C A. R I B B I N G. And you can find my book on Amazon. So it's pretty easy. Great. I will put all the links uh, under the show notes so everyone can read it while they are listening. So, any final wisdom you want to share with all our audience, no matter they are women or uh, men, if they are stuck in some work, uh, somewhat in their work, especially or in their life in general? Anything you want to wisdom? I would just say that it's going to sound trite, but life is too short to stay stuck. I, I work with people that have been stuck for 10 years and that's really sad because it's because by the time they change, they always are like, oh, I should have done this so much earlier. I wasted so much time. I, all these different things. And it is really hard. The longer you let it go the harder it is to actually change. Mm, Great. Wow. A lot of deep wisdom feels like acceptance, facing the problems, the the courage, right? Not running away. If you have the courage running away, have the courage facing it. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you so much, Becca. Thank you for uh, sharing all this wonderful knowledge and your book with us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for watching our videos or listening to our podcast. If you like our show, please feel free to subscribe, like, and share it. If you have any questions or feedback, we would always love to hear from you. You can either email us or leave feedback on our website at mindbodygarden.com or directly under the YouTube video channel. Thank you very much for your company today and hopefully to hear from you 
or have you with us next time.